into this. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege to share your word. We are here in this house of prayer at a very important moment in time. It's important for each of us as individual believers, followers of, of yours, uh, Lord, to just open our hearts and to worship you and to receive into our lives what you have for us. It's important for us as, as uh, friends and family to gather together and as a church family. So it's a great time. It's the one time a week we have opportunity to do this in this form. May the Holy Spirit speak into all of our lives, and importantly, may we receive what you're speaking to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let me mention just a few quick things to you in beginning. First of all, minister told of a Christian soldier, or of a soldier who became a Christian uh, while in the service, because he had seen several of his fellow soldiers make fun of another Christian uh, person in the group. But what impressed him was that every time these soldiers went off to do something, probably that they shouldn't be doing, uh, they left their valuables with this Christian soldier. And so this other soldier, who wasn't a Christian at the time, kept watching all of that. And through that process, he came to know Jesus Christ as his own personal Savior. People are watching our lives, and they will laugh at us, they will mock us, many people will, unfortunately, but you watch. When it comes to a moment of trust, they'll trust us before they'll trust their friends, and it'll make an impact on their lives. Many of you might know who Chuck Colson is. If you don't, you can read about him. There's quite a history there. But he made this statement all the way back in an enrichment retreat uh, back in 1995. He's a historical figure. Uh, Here's what he said. He said, a pastor must have incredible patience, perseverance, and courage, real guts, because he will be offending a good part of his congregation much of the time. However, he must teach people that the job of the church is not to make them happy, but to make them holy. Hello. If you're not remember, if you don't know it, holy simply means separated for God or set apart for God. Our purpose here is for us to draw near to God. I mentioned in this series when we began, we are God hunters. We are here to hunt for God's direction in our life, for Him to speak into our hearts as individuals, families, church. And then finally, one other final item here. Uh, This is a very powerful story. It's not new. Some of you may be aware of it. Most of you probably not. A young man who had accepted a call into missions work, he and his wife went to Africa to serve that calling. While in Africa... His wife became deathly ill, and because of that, her health precluded them from fulfilling that mission call. So they returned to the United States, and he made a commitment that he would do all that he could uh, to earn money in America and to help support missions around the world. His father was a dentist. His father, as a dentist, had already begun making an unfermented grape juice to be used in the communion services. And so this young man took what his father began, developed, continued it, took over the family business. Their last name is Welch, and today they continue to provide us with Welch grape juice for our communion services. That all began going back to a young man called into mission service, and then that hope was dashed. It's an interesting side sermon to all of that. You know, God, why'd you call them, then bring them back, do this and that? But God works in unusual ways in our lives, doesn't he? And we have to learn to work with the curves and the angles and just keep our eyes focused on Christ and, and just know that he's got a plan. But that's quite a powerful story. It's an old story. It's been known for years. But I wanted to share it with you today because we serve a God of hope. And even when we think that the mission field is what we're supposed to do and we're there, we have to come home, what's happened, did I miss God, whatever... God's got a plan. So whatever's going on in your life, if you've taken a detour, if things have flipped on you, if you're going right where you were going left, uh, whatever the case may be, trust God. He's got a plan. Our series is Soul Safari, and today is part three, The Hunt for Hope. All of these messages, and Pastor Rob's going to step in and add another one next week for you while Marsh and I are gone for just one Sunday. Uh, but all these messages are very important. And the, the thing about any message a pastor preaches in any church you might attend is if that particular message happens to hit the very area of place you're living in in life, you're all glued. If it's not, then 
you know, it has various levels of impact on your life depending on how you approach sermon time. Uh, but when you are dealing with the subject of hope, of all these messages, I think this is the one that is most needful for us today. Our country, our people, certainly the world, but let's reduce it to our country and to our, our area, our people, and our uh, people in our church, uh, as well as other churches. Hope is the big issue of today. It's a real problem. And, uh, you know, we are praying with the people in Grantsville at this terrible shooting tragedy uh, uh, Friday night over there, and uh, uh, it's just a terrible thing that's happened. But this is happening in a lot of places because people have lost hope. There's a lot of things that are causes of these, but a loss of hope is at the core of it. Marriages are falling apart because there's a loss of hope that will ever be repaired. Um, they're just, it's a big issue. So I, I believe this message today is going to be a life changer, a game changer for some of you. Before we leave the altar today, some of you are going to be on a better, better course than you were before you came in. Our text is in the book of Acts chapter 16, verse 25 to 31. Now because so many people today that attend our churches are less uh, biblically aware than before, we're going to read quite a bit of scripture because I want you to see the whole picture. But we'll begin those readings in a few moments. The soul of a human being cannot live without hope. You have to understand that. You cannot live without hope. The Bible is very clear that if you don't have hope, it's just not going to work. You have to have hope in every aspect of your life. Whatever curves are thrown at you, you have to find hope in those situations or you will be defeated. And when people get to the ultimate level of loss of hope, then we see the very tragic events unfurl. Events that are as tragic as an isolated or a group tragedy. You have to have hope to survive. I have to have hope as a pastor that I'm making a difference. I have to have hope as a husband that, I'm, that, that, that it's going well. I have to have hope um, in just every area. I have to have hope that I can pay my bills. I have to have hope Uh, that I can physically get around and do my thing. Or I have to have hope that whenever something happens that, that changes those circumstances, that I've got another avenue to be effective or to be um, purposeful or to have value. Every area of our life, we must have hope in order to survive. In your uh, notes, you'll see a statement there that our soul needs hope to survive and to thrive. It doesn't say our soul needs money to survive and to thrive. I mentioned it last week, millionaires, billionaires, people who have it all in the world's eyes are taking their lives out in epidemic proportions because money doesn't replace hope. So that's what we're going to look at today, how you can be filled with hope. If you are here today and you feel hopeless, and I am confident that there are some here today, let alone those, I don't even know how many people listen to the sermons around the world. We get all kinds of responses from that, that are without hope today. I'm not preaching this message to fill a slot. This message is for you today. If you are here and you feel hopeless today, God wants to fill you with hope. This isn't candy. This is reality. To move you from a hopeless place to a place of hope. To change your life from a downward trajectory that is going to lead to death and destruction. To putting you on the trajectory to go up to where you can have a prosperous and blessed life through Christ. All of us have had times of feeling hopeless. Make no mistake about it. There's not a soul in this room that hasn't had a time where you felt hopeless about some situation in your life. It could be a job, marriage, destructive habits you can't seem to shake, a child or a friend that desperately needs to change their behavior. But as Marcia said this morning when we were talking, as she counsels people, she always reminds them, the one thing you cannot do, regardless of the relationship, is change another person. You cannot do that. Only God, through His power, can change a person, and even that, has to be by invitation. Hello, are you out there? You cannot change that ornery husband you married. You should have thought of that before you married him. Okay? 
Now all you can do is try to influence, but you can't change. You can influence, but you can't change them. You understand? You can't change your teenager. You can only try to influence them. The list goes on. We cannot change people. We can only try to influence them. Maybe it's a loss of hope or hopelessness about your future or about your health. And that list goes on. And I know those are standard categories. I get that. That's the world we live in. But all of our hopelessness that we might be experiencing, and some of you today very seriously, God wants to fill you with hope today. In our text, we're going to see Paul and Silas, who are the first missionaries to Europe. They're in a city called Philippi, which is in the country of Greece. You're surely familiar with that country. And they are preaching the gospel. Now, because they are preaching the gospel, not because they robbed a bank or something like that, because they are preaching the gospel... There is a mob that forms against them. They are beaten, put in chains, and then they are thrown into prison. Now, they're in this city, far, far away from home. They are bloodied and bruised. They have been severely beaten. They are wearing shackles, and they're in a very filthy prison cell. In this passage that we're going to read in our text, and the verses preceding and following as we go through the message, we're going to see the key to unlocking the prison doors of hopelessness. It's not a joke. It's the only way you're going to move from your despair to your promise. So let's look at our text in the book of Acts chapter 16. Now if you've got your scriptures, just stay in that chapter. We're going to be reading a lot in there today. But for the text, we're going to start with chapter 16 and read the actual account of Paul and Silas in prison there in verse 25 to 31. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. It's kind of interesting there. It's not just Paul and Silas's chains that came loose, but everybody's chains came loose. And the jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. Because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We're all here. It's an unusual response by prisoners, isn't it? The the jailer called for lights, rushed and fell, trembling before Paul and Silas. And he then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. In your notes, a very simple point, number one, just to make sure your mind is is tuned in properly, and that is midnight moments. Midnight moments. You notice it in verse 25 in the text I just read. It's the first two words there, about midnight. About midnight. Midnight moments. Paul and Silas had been having a great time. I mean, they're missionaries. They're preaching the gospel. People are coming to know the Lord. They are walking in a blessed atmosphere right now in their lives. They started out on this huge high as they had seen a woman by the name of Lydia and her family come to the Lord. I want to back you up in that same chapter 16, and let's go to the beginning of the real story here in verse 11 through 15. So let's go back from where Paul and Silas are in prison to the beginning of this story. In verse 11, it says, From Troas we put out to sea and sailed straight to Samothrace, and on the next day we traveled to Neapolis, and from there we traveled to Philippi. That's where they're at now in this story. A Roman colony and the leading city of the district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city, gate to the river. Now, the Sabbath, that's their day of rest. It's a day to honor God. We talked about that last week. So on the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer because that's what you do on the Sabbath. You get your eyes on the Lord. We talked about last week. We sat down and began to speak to the woman who had gathered, to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. She was a God hunter. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. And when she and her members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she 
persuaded us. So they're on their way to their typical Saturday prayer time and honoring God, a day of rest. But everything goes downhill after all of this because they come across a woman that I'm going to read to you in a moment about who has an evil spirit that is harassing them, and she does this for several days. They eventually tire of it, Paul and Silas, and they cast the demon out of her. But her gift was of such great value to the community leaders and business people there uh, that the locals pounced on Paul and Silas. So after what I just read to you in verses 11 to 15, we now come to the next passage right in front of our text of verse 25 to 31 and read verse 16 to 24, and that'll fill in the final blocks there in front of our text. Let's read it. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, in other words, we're going to worship God, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days, and finally Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the Spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas. The magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods, quite violently here. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. In other words, they weren't going to let him commit suicide in the jail. Just wondered if you all were up with the news, you know, Epstein. Okay, now I'll move along. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. So, Paul and Silas is in the midst of a midnight moment. Things look as bleak as it can get for them. You have to understand that all of us experience our own midnight moments. And some of you are there today. Your circumstances are against you. The problem, pain, have hit your life and you've been blindsided. Paul and Silas was doing great. People are responding to the gospel. Lydia gets saved. Her whole household. They're going down for their normal routine of prayer and just honoring God. And the next thing you know, they're beaten within an inch of their life and thrown into a prison and Everything about their life is threatened, seriously threatened. Maybe you're here today and life has brought you to your knees and it's a very dark place that you're in right now. We know about some of those because you've come for counseling or help or prayer. You're in a midnight moment and you feel hopeless today. Please understand, we don't take this lightly. I've been here long enough to have witnessed a young man in this church, came to the church, wasn't raised in the church, but had been coming for some time, a dear friend of a long time attender, young man, sat here in church, knew he struggled with depression things, and after church, he had just heard me preach, we'd had a great service, and went home and killed himself. Another Sunday when we were having two services because of lack of parking and facilities, I preached the first sermon, and in the time waiting for the second sermon uh, service to start, I got a call that across the street, one of our very beloved persons who struggled a great deal, but very loved, took his life. So between services, I ran across the, uh, the street, came back, preached the second service, and didn't inform the congregation until after the service was over, which left them stunned. I can go on and on and on and on and on. Good people do stupid things, irreversible things, in a moment of a depth of hopelessness. And you can judge them, you can curse them, you can do whatever you want. It doesn't change the reality that they didn't just wake up one morning and decide they'd do something extremely stupid because they wanted to be stupid. They had lost their hope. People can be pushed by other forces into a corner. And they will respond with irreversible, poor decisions. But at the expense of you ridiculing me or getting angry with me, sometimes understandable. Not justifiable. I didn't say justifiable. I said understandable. Are you listening? I did not say justifiable. I said understandable. 
I can understand why you did something and not justify that you did it. Somebody say, amen, or I'm going to preach till 2 o'clock. People are blowing their brains out. Families are being destroyed. We've got an entire family where one of the teenage kids blew out his three siblings and his mother and attempted to take out his father. And one of his siblings found out about it on Facebook as he was away at college. And Grantsville's dealing with that this morning. It happens in Layton. It happens in Ogden. It, happens, it doesn't happen with the poor down and out drug addicts all the time. It happens with upstanding and often very rich families. People lose hope. Their marriages were idealistic. Everything was going good. But they refused to go to a marriage counseling and improve, and they just kept getting further and further apart. Marcia was telling me a statistic the other day that anywhere between 30 to 60%, which is a rather wide percentage, as I pointed out to her, but in other, way, in other words, Forget that. 30 to 60% of married people will cheat on their spouse. And from what I'm observing, I would go with 60%. It's a mess. And for years, people have sold out to sex as though sex is your cure-all to everything. Sex is like money or anything else. It loses its, it loses its um, satisfaction in your life if it's abused. You understand? I could go on, but my point is, people who are hopeless today is a big, big issue. And if you're in a midnight moment right now, you're feeling hopeless, depression, anxiety, doubt, despair, stemming from issues from marriage, kids, health, money, job, relationships, or failure, understand everyone goes into their midnight moments. But it's what you do in the midnight moments of your life that will make or break you. I'm going to say that again. Every one of us go through our midnight moments. You're not going to escape it. I haven't escaped it. That's not debatable. You're going to be there if you're... If you're not there today. The only issue is what are you going to do in that moment? What are you going to do in your midnight moment? Because it will determine not only the rest of your life and maybe your eternity, but those around you as well. What Paul and Silas did at midnight made all the difference. It takes us to point number two, which is where all the meat of the material is. What do you do in the midnight moments? Or what to do in the midnight moments? Let's go through this. You're going to see a lot of stuff. Number one, sing songs of hope. Sing songs of hope. You think, well, that's really? Yes, really. Look in verse number 25 again. It says that about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. They're beaten within an inch of their life. They started their day in great spiritual victory. All is well. They could sing, all is well with my soul, and it's great. At midnight, they find themselves in prison under these terrible conditions. Singing songs of hope. Obviously, prayer goes with that. They were singing praise songs to God while chained behind prison bars. Songs of hope, even when they couldn't hear the music. I'm telling you, we've all been there. I, I was in a place like that. I was running red lights with my car, completely oblivious to what's going on because I was in such a state of, God, where are we going? Where is, where is this going? What's happening? You think I wasn't changed by experiencing at such a depth that what I experienced, it changed me forever, in my opinion, for the better. And thank God I didn't kill nobody in the process. If you're here hopelessly, I know what that's like. I've been there. Well, pastor, I thought your life was perfect. I never said my life was perfect. never said I was. I just said I'm no worse than you, so don't get cocky. Right? I know what it's like. I didn't before some of those experiences. I had no idea, really. You go through it, you know what it's like, and now you say, okay, I understand. May not justify things, but I understand it. Don't think for a moment that Paul and Silas were naive. You listen to me. Don't think they were naive. 
Do not think for a moment. Here's Paul and Silas in the prison, and they're naive to everything going around. Hey, it's all great. God is good. These guys understood the danger they were in. They understood that they had been flipped in without notice into a midnight moment. A phone call came that they were completely unexpecting, if you please, in modern day. And their world was turned upside down. And from what had been a fairly mundane and certain approach for the day or the week or the month ahead with manageable distractions, now their entire life is threatened. They weren't naive. They knew they were in pain. They knew they'd been beaten within an inch of their life. And they knew that their life on this planet was threatened. But they chose to attack their midnight moment with songs of hope. They were hurting, concerned, maybe even a little confused. God, how did this happen? What are you doing? They had lost their freedom. They had a choice to make, and you want to put this down the side of your notes. They had a choice to make, and here it was. Give in or praise out. Put that in the side of your notes. When you're in your midnight moment, you have a choice to make. Are you going to give in to that midnight moment? Or are you going to praise out of it? In your notes there, I think you'll see that we have to believe, as Paul and Silas did, that there's no such thing as a hopeless situation with a God of hope. We have to believe that. We're not naive. We're not flipping about it. We're fully aware that our life is threatened. We're fully aware that everything around us that is normal and good and healthy is being threatened. We understand that we're having to dig to the depths of our, 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 our spiritual moorings and our, our, just our constitution uh, within us, the strength to, to fight, a determination to fight, to even survive. But we have a choice to make in the midnight moments. Do we give in or do we praise out? The second thing you have to do is to trust God, who is the source of hope. You're in your midnight moment, serious business, trust God. Verse number 31, that's the last verse of our text. It said, they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Paul and Silas knew that God knew what he was doing, and they trusted him. Listen, every one of us go through experiences in life where we are doing what we know to do because we've been trained, we trust God. We're not, we're not ignoring the concerns, the threats, the possibilities, but we're trusting God. That's what Paul and Silas did. They were well acquainted with God, the source of hope. They knew that he knew more than they did about the situation. So, I think it's in your notes here as well, don't put your hope in money or man Put it in God. Most of us don't have enough money to put our hope there, so now we're left with man. Well, most of us don't have enough people uh, that we really trust, and even then they're going to be limited. Put your hope in God. Let's go over to Romans and just read one verse, Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope, notice this now, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Your hope is powered by the Holy Spirit. Your hope isn't powered by man or money. It's powered by the Holy Spirit. Let's go on, you'll see. When you place your hope in Christ, rather than circumstances, there's no circumstance that can steal your song of hope. Let me tell you, again, I want to make sure you understand where I'm not being flippant with you. I'm talking about driving down the highway. You're in a moment of midnight uh, moments. You're, you're dealing with a lack of hope. You're fighting depression. You've got a choice to make, give in or praise out. So you turn your channel to the Christian radio station, or you just begin singing some songs you've sung in church that you know the words to without the screen help. 
and you begin to just sing songs. You're not singing them as a mighty warrior. My God is God over all, and Satan, you are defeated. You're saying, God, you are my God. You're over all. You understand the difference? It's trust. But you're moving from a low place. You're not moving from up here. You're moving from here. And you're reaching for that depth of trust that you believe. And you're singing songs. And you begin to sense the presence of God. And it lifts you some. It may not take you all the way to the top. You may not, by the time you get to your destination, be ready to give the devil a... a Karate chop or whatever they do, I don't know. But you will feel the lifting because you're choosing to praise out instead of give in. Pain, stress, loss, grief cannot take away your song of hope. The song of hope wells up from within us because it comes from God, the source of hope. Go back to Psalm 118 real quick and verses 13 and 14. I was pushed back and about to fall. But the Lord help me. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. I think you saw the word defender in the praise songs this morning. It's a powerful verse. Let's go to number three. Watch for God's provision. When you're hopeless, when you're hunting for hope, watch for God's provision. Go back to our text in Acts chapter 16 and look at verse 26. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. Now, folks, surely you understand this is the original version of Jailhouse Rock. I was going to wear my Elvis Presley outfit and just preach it in that today, but and do my singing impersonation, but I didn't have enough time. The truth of the matter is Elvis Presley was late for the party. He missed it by 2,000 years. In verse 25, be it says the other prisoners were listening to them. Before God's provision in verse 26, these other prisoners might have thought Paul and Silas were nuts. They're singing. But they weren't nuts. Listen close. This is very critical for those of you that are really, really in trouble this morning. They knew not to operate based on their feelings. They knew it was all about God's power, not their feelings. Please understand that. Your place of victory comes from God's power, not your feelings. You see, people today, I'm talking about Christians, operate on their feelings, too many of them, that is, rather than God's power. Listen to me. Our whole, everything in America tells you to follow your feelings, watch the movies, listen to the songs. It's all driving you to follow your feelings. That's a lie from hell. God gave you a brain, use it. As Marcia tells people in counseling, once you know the decision you should make, you make the decision and let your heart catch up to you. Listen to me, that's good preaching. Use your head. My whole life I've had these super spiritual people from preachers to laymen tell me I'm not as spiritual as I should be. I should be more like them. I said, no, thank you. You can have your life. I don't like it. Because you do stupid stuff. And then you try to pray and twist it around and pritzel it. If you'd have just made a good decision to begin with, you wouldn't have had to jump through all those spiritual hoops. Once you know the right decision to make, Whatever that decision is, you know it. This is it. Eliminate the heart, make the decision, and let your heart catch up to the right decision. The Bible tells you that your heart will deceive you. How much plainer does it have to be? Your heart will deceive you. You make your decisions with your head. And if your head's not real smart, find a good friend with a smart head. That's simple. Most of the dumb stuff that happens around here is dumb because it was dumb. Now that's profound. Use your head. Quit making decisions with your feelings. 
Rarely are there days when I don't feel like I love Marcia with all of my heart. But occasionally she just irritates the far out of me. <laughs> right? And once in a while it even happens to her about me. Well, I don't go find me someone to go hop in bed with because I'm ticked at Marsha. I don't go and spend $500 just to get back at Marsha because I don't feel good towards her that day. I make intelligent decisions based on God's Word to be sure as a believer, but I make intelligent decisions, right? Wow, that's a little too plain for me. Well, there's churches down the street, but... I'd prefer you stay here. But you could spend a lot less time in a lot of these uncomfortable places you're at if you just make good decisions. To begin. Paul and Silas didn't make their decisions based on feelings. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. Today people do that. Church people, Christian people. For all the teaching they have in Scripture, they keep letting their feelings dictate their decisions. And as a result of that, they go to church if they feel like it. They tithe if they feel like it. They pray if they feel like it. They're nice if they feel like it. They praise God if they feel like it. And the list just goes on if they feel like it. I don't want a relationship with someone who's just going to be good towards me if they feel like it. No, thank you. Go find you another friend. Pastor, that's terrible. Are you serious? Do you think I'm looking for... 20, 50, or 100 people just to pile on and just dump all your manure on me and just see if I can handle the weight? You're nuts. We'll help you. We'll give you what we can give you. But there's going to come a limit. Hello? I'm looking for people that can add into my life, not take away from it. Hello? You say, preacher, are you real? Yeah, I'm real and so are you. And if you don't do that, then you're in that dumb category. And you're making decisions with your feelings. Goes with your kids. There comes a point where you have to look at your kids and say, you know, you can keep doing that. But my feelings for you as a parent is not going to trump what my brain's telling me. I'm going to do what I have to do because I know it's what I have to do, even though you're breaking my heart. And if you let your kids run your heart, you're a fool. And you will pay a price. And they will gain nothing by it. It will only harm them more. I could go on, but I'm meddling, so let's keep moving. Paul and Silas could sing songs of hope because they operated on God's power, not their feelings. If you're operating on your feelings, you're dead in the water now before we ever finish this message. You've got to flip the switch to operating on God's power, not your feelings. And that's the kind of faith that knocks down prison walls and breaks chains that hold us back. God's power. Choosing to sing songs of hope when you're feeling hopeless is faith. Let me say it again. That is faith. Choosing to praise out is faith. Even if it's whimper songs. Even if it's sung with, with discipline more than belief, for lack of a better way of saying it. And in your notes, I think, is the statement, faith unlocks prison doors and opens a pathway for God to work. Faith unlocks prison doors. My friends, I was talking to an adult person this past week, and they were going on about the successes here and blah, 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 blah. And I said to this person, I said, look, you have to understand something. I'm nowhere near as good as people lift me up to be. And what what incredible ministry we've had here for these 33 and a half plus years now is largely because of the people around me, but without going into the whole story because I don't have time, the point that I made to the person, I said, people think I'm being <laughs> flippant or, or somewhat foolish when I make the statement, but I'm not. I said, when I gave my life to Christ at 12 years of age, I was simply a hillbilly type boy raised dirt poor, who simply put my trust in God. And from that day on, I simply made a commitment that settled in my spirit that I was going to trust God no matter what came my way. I was just 12 years old. And I said, 
through all of the experiences I've had, I have to go back and it is God and only God who has chosen to ordain the successes that we have had. From the hiring of people that's helped make us success to the drawing in of people in this ministry, you, to help make this a success, it all goes back to God. It is God's power. It is not our feelings. It's not even our intellect. It is God's power. He has the power in our midnight moments to set us free or to use us, uh, not only for our good, but for those around us. You have to understand the importance of God's power in your life. i got to go to number four real quick. Encourage the hopeless. Encourage the hopeless. In verse 27 of our text in Acts 16, it says, The jailer woke up. And when he, now notice he woke up, so he was knocked out. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew a sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. If you don't know what's going on here, let me explain. The jailer is knocked out because of the earthquake. It's a violent earthquake, obviously, from the description. Because the penalty for letting prisoners escape was a torturous death, he was simply going to kill himself rather than being tortured to death. He was hopeless. But Paul stopped him. In verse number 28, again, I know I've read it already, but Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. When Paul, and this is in your notes here, encouraged this jailer, everything changed for him. My friend, encourage the hopeless. Please zero in on what I said earlier. It's not in your notes, but it was important. There's a difference between understanding where someone is at in their mind versus justifying what they're wanting to do or even have done. There is no question that as believers, we have erred in my lifetime on judgment versus love. And our human nature, it is true spiritually, politically, relationally, sometimes even financially, we tend to move pendulums swinging far right, far left. We we struggle with balance in life. Balance is a key word in your life, and we struggle with that. We want to overcompensate. But I am thankful we're living in a place right now where we're moving in a much uh, better place, a more biblical place, I think a more Christ-like place, of, of focusing more on love instead of judgment. Because we need to begin to understand. We need to be able to step back and say, okay, I'd really like to take your head off right now. Pastor, you have that problem? It's worse. I've taken a head or two off. You know what I mean? But we need to, there are times we need to step back and say, okay, I'm, I'm not happy with you right now at all. But I do understand what you're thinking. Sometimes you adults with kids, uh, with teenagers, you would be a much better parent if you'd quit being so offended by your teenager's behavior and try to understand what's going on in their life. And help them. If this is where they are, this is where they are. It may not be where they should be, or certainly not where you think they should be. You may think they should know better, but none of that really matters. This is where they are. If you're talking to a person here, like they're over here, you just as well not be talking. It's true in a marriage, it's true in anything else. We need to encourage the hopeless. We need to encourage more calm, martial-like communication with people. Who understands how to communicate with people that she absolutely disagrees with their thinking, their actions, or whatever, but she doesn't sit there and say, what a dingbat you are. That's what I say. You know, we could be sitting here watching a ball game, but now we're talking about something stupid you did. Marsha, on the other hand, says, well, let's talk about that. Why did you do that? You, You understand what I'm saying? Now, I'm really not as bad as I make myself out to be, but you get the idea. Okay? 
We need to encourage the hopeless. They're struggling. Look at verse 29 to 31 real quick. We'll wrap this up. The jailer called for the lights, rushed and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, you and your household. The jailer was hungry for hope. He didn't even know it until that moment, but he was on a soul safari for hope. He was a jailer doing his job, got his paycheck, went home to his wife, kids. I don't know what kind of a salary he was drawing, but... There was nothing really great going on in his life, and he certainly spiritually was without hope. He was on a soul safari for hope, hungry. And in verse 32 to 34, that exceeds what we'd read before, then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. And at at that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all of his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. There's a key. The joy came when he came to know God. All the sex in the world, all the money in the world, even all the power in the world will not solve your hunt for hope. It will not do it. Surely you're smart enough to have seen that and read about that and know that to be true. Your hope is found in the power of Christ and in no other. And all other pursuits will lead you to the same point of despair at one level or another. I like the end of this account in verse 35 to 40. Here's what it says. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order to release those men. The jailer told Paul and the magistrates have ordered for you and Silas to be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. But Paul said to the Officers, they beat us publicly without a trial. Even though we are Roman citizens and threw us into prison. Paul's playing quite a card here. Listen to me. I wish I had time to tell you about what's going on in America today because I'm telling you, if you're not scared, you should be. But I'm going to say this, and don't you get mad at me for being political. I'm not trying to be political. I'm talking to you about practicality. Stanley Hoare, you're the second man in the Democratic Party power, just made the statement that Donald Trump's had ample opportunity to prove his innocence. Every black person in this building ought to know how scared you ought to be of that because for centuries, black people in our communities had to prove their innocence when our law says that you're innocent until proven guilty. That should scare the bejeebies out of every one of you. Prove your innocence? I could go on and on and on. Paul stood up. He said, I'm a Roman citizen. I have rights. And so he stands up here and he says this. Even though we were Roman citizens and threw us into prison, and now do they want to get rid of us quietly? Have I shook you up yet? No, let them come themselves and escort us out. Oh, I love Paul. I love it. You little scoundrels, you think you're going to get away with that? We put one of our worship leaders in jail. He spent three months. He had led worship in some of the biggest churches in the nation. It's a long story, and he stole from us, and we filed charges. He threatened and followed through with filing sexual harassment charges against me towards his wife, which was bogus. I said, buddy, you just picked on the wrong preacher. As I've told people before, I can put my arm around you and love you, or I can pull my gun out and shoot you, because it don't make me a whole lot of difference. Any shepherd will shoot a wolf in sheep's clothing. Any shepherd. You touch my congregation, I will shoot you. I meant it. The prosecutor said it never happened. I said, you watch, he will go to prison. The prosecutor, who is a very good friend of mine, said it'll never happen. You watch it. That day in court, it happened, and I looked over to the prosecutor for Davis County. And he said, Mike, I would have never believed it. Paul said, nah, you're not getting off that easy. We're Roman citizens. You come and escort us out of here. Why? Because he's operating with the intellect, not the heart. He's operating in the power of God, not in his feelings. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, I know, I need to quit, so let's move on. The officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. Too late. 
They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison. Notice they did it. Oh, yes, let's go escort him. Requesting them to leave the city. And I love verse 40. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house. Well, who's Lydia? This is where this all began, remember? On a good day. They went to Lydia's house where they met with their brothers and sisters, encouraged them, and then they left. Stand with me, would you please? Powerful stuff. Now I'm going to close. I want you to stay with me. Prayer partners are coming. I'm going to do this in two parts, and I'm very serious about it because I know how serious this moment is. Prayer partners are coming. You're here today. You're not a Christian. Please listen to me. You have no hope outside of Christ. You listen to me. There is no hope outside of Christ. I don't care if you're American or one of these two, uh, 20, 29, 29 different countries we have represented here in our student body section. It applies to every human being on this planet earth. Your hope is only found in Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, I'm asking you this morning to get very real with me. Your eternity and your life right now is the difference in the decision whether you're going to give in or praise out. Whether you're going to turn your life over to Christ or not. I'm fully aware that most people in this church are Christians today. But there are those of you here today, you're not a Christian. I don't need a notch in my belt or a feather in my cap. Don't need that. I'm telling you, search the world over, read the books, study history, do what you need to do. You're going to find that the only intellectually honest conclusion that solves the spiritual needs of the human race is Jesus Christ. That's it. I told you in a sermon two weeks ago or so, I made the statement that I didn't make a decision for Christ from an intellectual, uh, from an emotional place. I made it from an intellectual. Didn't mean that the emotions aren't connected. Of course there was emotions connected. But I searched the scriptures. Even at 12, I was smart. I had a brain at 12. You don't just start getting smart at 31, although some people act like it. You've actually got that brain. You can use it, if you will, as a teenager, as a young person. And if you're here today, I'm telling you, do all the academics you need to do. You're going to find that the only possibility presented to you by the world's history of having any spiritual uh, footings, moorings, foundation, validity to it is the claims of Jesus Christ. And if you're here today and you're not a Christian, I'm asking you to stop playing around. Stop messing with your life. Stop taking chances that you won't get into a situation that's irreversible and your life ruined before it ever gets started or goes any further. I'm asking you to step out of your seat right now. Just come down to one of these prayer partners and pray with them. I'm asking you. If you're a little awkward feeling, then grab someone by the arm and just drag them. They'll know what you're doing. Just drag them down. They'll walk with you. The second thing I want you to do, and you can come now. It's all up to you. It's your life. It's your eternity. But I'm asking you to do that. But here's what's really, really, really important. There are many of you here today that are in a midnight moment. Been there. I'm telling you, I'm empathizing with you. I'm not just trying to understand you. I'm not just trying to feel your pain. I empathize with you. I've been there. I know what it's like. I'm telling you, you have an option, a choice to make. You can give in to that midnight moment and watch your life be destroyed for days, weeks, months, or in some cases, a life. Or you can praise out of it. It's your choice. This house is filled with people that praised out of their midnight moments. We're here today because we've chose to praise out. I can give you the names and addresses of people in our community that their lives are miserable today. Some of them served on deacon board here. Some served as ushers. Some served in music department. They came to midnight hours and they chose to give in to their midnight moment. And their lives are miserable today. 
I can give you the examples. Wouldn't be cool, but I can do it. It's there. You can look at it. You can read it. Give in or praise out. And if you're here today and you're in a midnight moment, I'm telling you my heart's breaking for you because I know. And so does a lot of people in this church know. And I'm going to ask you to step out and come and just come to this front area. We're just going to have one prayer for all of you that want to come. You're in a midnight moment. You're feeling hopeless. Your marriage, your finances, your health, your spiritual journey, your, whatever it is, you're, you're there. I'm going to ask you to come right here, and I don't care if it's one. If it's none, then I'm going home to watch Chiefs. I don't care what these Packer fans think. It don't make a bit of difference to me. I'm going home to watch Chiefs. But if you're in a midnight moment, this is your opportunity to turn to the power of God. I'm asking you to come right now. I'm just going to give you a moment, and we're going to close with prayer. If you want to come, come. Right here. You're in a midnight moment. I don't have to know which category it is. It doesn't matter. Just come right here so we can pray together as a group. When you run stop lights, red lights, because you were so zoned out in the depth of your hopelessness, you know what I'm talking about. If you can't get out of bed to go to work because of hopelessness, you know what I'm talking about. Just come and gather right here. Get real close. Our hearts are breaking for people that are in midnight moments because we know. We're not in church this morning just to do a thing. I try to preach messages that will help every person that will come. I try to make them relevant. relevant. But we're here to encounter the power of God. It's the only hope we have. It's the only hope I've got. It's the only hope you've got. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, these folks have gathered here this morning. Our prayer partners are gathering around them. Lord Jesus, we're in this house of prayer in a moment where we need You. We need the raw power of God to move in our lives in this midnight moment. We need that earthquake of Your power to shake things up. But we recognize that we have a role to play as well. And that role is whether we're going to give in or praise out. And these people are choosing to praise out right now. They're choosing God to come to you and to lay their hurt before you right now. Their fears. They're not naive no more than Paul and Silas were. They know the real threats. They know the problems. They know the mountain that they have to climb. They know the boulders that are upon their backs, the weight. They know the limitations that they have. But they know that you're the power that can make a difference and change all things. Lord Jesus, I lift every one of these people up to you today. You know their names. You know what they're going through. I pray, Lord, that every one of these persons know right now that they are valued that you do have a plan. And that if, they're, if they've been beaten and bruised and are in an old jail cell of life, and it seems like they were blindsided and this just came upon them without notice, or even if it's been building and they're just beginning to really become aware of how serious this is, I pray, Lord, that on this Sunday morning, the 19th of January, 2020, they are making a commitment to you to trust you. To sing songs of hope and praise to you. To even reach out to others and encourage them in the midst of their own battle. I pray God right now that they take hold of this and never let it go. Never let it go. From this day forward, they will walk in the fullness of the power of Christ. They will set their feelings to the side when necessary. And they will walk in the power of your promises, of your truth, of your work. Lord Jesus, I know miracles are needed in some situations. You do miracles. And I'm praying for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you leave today? Sing another song with Hanny.